The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We've been waiting for you. We knew that you'd be back. We know that by now you've discovered there's no fear like the fear you can hear. And we're going to fill your ears with a story about the most basic fear of all. Death. We're going to tell you a story about a man who dispenses death the way other men dispense haircuts. A man known in the parlance of the underworld as the hitman. In case you're unfamiliar with criminal vocabulary, allow me to explain. A hitman is someone hired especially to terminate the life of someone else. Our mystery drama, The Hitman, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Mike Kellen. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Our story begins in a bus terminal of a large eastern city, a place of arrivals and departures. In the crowd, we can see a rather sallow young man searching every face and scowling at his inability to recognize the man he has come to find. But then, he doesn't know what Jim Derry looks like. Jim Derry tries not to make himself too visible a person. Mr. Derry has a very good reason. But now, the young man spots someone pulling on a pair of light-colored gloves. And he recognizes the signal, if not the man. Uh... Warm day for gloves, ain't it, mister? I got cold hands. <sighs> Jim Derry? Yes. <laughs> I'm Earl. What took you so long? Arnie said you'd be on the two o'clock bus. I've been hanging around this crummy terminal for an hour. A gypsy told me never to take a two o'clock bus. They didn't tell me you were a comedian. What did they tell you about me, Earl? Come on. Arnie's waiting. So, this is Arnie's warehouse. Oh, it's his warehouse, but he don't do much warehousing in it. Come on. His office is right here. Yeah, who is it? Uh, it's Earl, Mr. Harney. Come in. You took your sweet time getting here. Well, it wasn't my fault, Mr. Harney. He uh, didn't show until 4 o'clock. Sad idea, Derry. I hired somebody. I expect a little punctuality. Well, I told you. I didn't have to go outside the organization. I, I could handle it for you, Mr. Harney. I said I... shut up. I hate these family quarrels, do you? Want to talk business now or should I come back later? We talk now. Good. And give the kid a quarter and send him to the movies. Beat it, Earl. Yeah. Okay. All right, Derry. The family quarrel's over. Now let's talk shop. Okay. My price is three grand for the hit. I do good, clean work. Pick my own time and place. I never get my clients involved. How does that sound? Sounds fine. This is a private case. Strictly private. A guy named Eddie Breach. Breach used to work for me. Covered the best slice of territory in the city. His receipts were like five grand a week. Only they started to drop, understand? Four one week, two the next. Whole thing smelled bad. You don't mean he was a crook. I had him followed. Found out he was making book on his own, setting up his own shop. <laughs> he was robbing me blind. 
Who fingers him for me? I'll finger him this afternoon. See if you can make it fast. And see that I'm kept out of it. That's all. Not all, Mr. Harney. In cases like this, our company likes a deposit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Here's the ground now. You get the rest when I read that obituary. It's almost six o'clock. We've been staring at that apartment house for half an hour. Now you know how I felt, Derry, waiting in that bus station. I thought you said Breach should be home by now. Oh, he'll be here. I've been clocking him three Fridays in a row. He takes his wife to see the doctor every Friday afternoon, and they get back around now. You didn't tell me he was married. What difference does that make? I just hope he's insured. I like making rich widows. Hey, there's his car. Hand me those binoculars. <laughs> Don't forget to get a look at his wife. She's worth seeing, even if she is crippled. What? Look for yourself. A wheelchair. He's taking a wheelchair out of the back. She's got a nice pair of legs. Only they don't move. Paralyzed? That's right. Well, did you get a good look at him? Yes, I got a good look. Let's go. married a cripple. He didn't. That was no kitty car he was pushing around. Yeah, Chick was in one piece when he married her. In fact, what happened to her was all his fault. How do you mean? I got into an argument one day and he belted her. She fell down a flight of stairs and busted something in her back. He sounds like a real nice guy. It'll be a pleasure to do business with him. Yeah, well, don't forget who you're doing it for. Harney's paying you for this job, not Mrs. Breach. For her, I do it for love. Good <laughs> afternoon, mister. A lot cooler in here, isn't it? Yeah. It's a refrigerator. What are you having? Making a beer. Right. I uh, just hit this town yesterday... Still haven't found out where the action is. Uh, so? A friend of mine told me I might do myself some good here. You know anything about that? Well, it depends upon what kind of action you want. I'm flexible. For instance, I wouldn't mind doing business with a horse or two. I'm a bartender, not a bookie. This friend of mine told me a guy hangs around here named Breach. Eddie Breach? That's him. He said Breach might be the firm to do business with. You know him? Yeah, 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 I know Mr. Breach. He's a nice guy. Comes in here sometimes with his wife. His wife? In here? Well, why not? I run a family place here. What's Mrs. Breach like? Ah, uh, that woman is really something. She's a cripple, you know. In a wheelchair. But she never beefs about it. Best looking chick you ever saw, and she keeps right on smiling. Wheelchair and everything. That's tough, all right. Wheelchair. Hmm? It's like a stretch in prison. Oh, uh, she's lucky having a husband like Mr. Breach. He's real good to her. Buys her anything she wants. Takes her to the doctor every week. The way I heard it, Breach is the one who put her in the wheelchair. Well, I wouldn't know about that, but he treats her like a queen, I can tell you that. I mean, cripple or not, that is my idea of a happy marriage. Hey, hey, you didn't touch your beer. Okay, Mr. Breach, get in the car. Hey, what is this? Get in that car, I said. Okay, okay, easy on the hardware. Who are you? What do you want? Start your car, head west to the highway, and keep going until I tell you to stop. Listen, you want my wallet, take it. Start the car. for Joe Harney, do you? Keep driving. I asked you a question. I work for myself. Look, if Harney did send you, let's talk about it. I'll pay you twice what he's giving you. Just tell me how much. How do you know Harney wants you dead? Maybe it was your wife. Harney's not the only one who hates your guts. Connie? 
You're crazy. So that's her name, huh? Connie? She wouldn't do anything like that. She needs me. Needs you for what? The belt her again? Who told you about that? You must have been a pretty brave boy. Slugging a woman. That took guts. I'm trying to make it up to her. For peace sake, will you give me a chance to make it up to her? That's why I need that money. That's the only reason. So you did cheat her, honey. You admit it? I'd cheat my grandmother if it helped Connie. Keep your eyes on the road, Eddie. All right. Take that next side road. Listen, give me a chance to talk to you, will you? That's what we're going to have, a talk. Go on, pull over there near the billboard. All right. Answer me one question. How were you helping her? What? How were you helping your wife? This doctor you see every Friday. Did he say something could be done for her? No. I never said that. The spinal cord is all busted up. All he can do is make her more comfortable. So the sentence is life. You think I don't feel lousy about it? I know it was my fault, but I didn't mean it. She might be better off without you. Maybe she would. All right. Let's go. Where to now? We're going to your place. Eddie? Yeah, honey, it's me. Oh. You didn't tell me you were bringing anyone here. I uh, decided not to go downtown. I ran into a friend of mine, and uh, we got to talking. My and... name is Derry, Mrs. Breach. Jim Derry. I'm sorry to bust in on you like this. Oh, but I'm glad you did. Really. I love to see Eddie's friends. We don't do very much entertaining. You got a nice apartment, Mrs. Breach. Oh, thank you. I keep it uncluttered so I can scoot around easily in this wheelchair. My track record is one minute, three seconds, from the living room to the bedroom to the kitchen. <laughs> That's quite a record. Now, let me get you a drink. Eddie says I'm the best rolling bartender in town. Watch me. Don't bother, Mrs. Breach. I don't drink. Not on the job, right? Oh, please, let me get you something. You see, I'm grateful to you, Mr. Derry. <laughs> I was looking forward to a lonely evening when you came along. My husband usually works very late. Honey, you look a little tired. Did you take your pills yet? Oh, I'm fine, Eddie. Stop worrying about me. Please sit down, Mr. Derry. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to talk to one of Eddie's friends. Well, let's cut this out. He's no friend of mine. I never saw him before in my life. What? Tell her who you work for, Derry. All right. At the moment, I work for a man named Joe Harney. <gasps> Harney? That's right. And... And what do you want from us? I want us to sit down and have a talk. I'm already sitting down, Mr. Derry. Joe Harney isn't pleased with your husband, Mrs. Breach. He thinks he cheated him. Cheated him out of a lot of money. Well, I'm sure that's not true. I didn't cheat him. I just wanted the business for myself. I got a right to go into business for myself. Yes, I know. It's called free enterprise. But just the same, Mr. Harney is very angry. He's not just angry, he's afraid. He's worried that if Eddie gets away with this, he'll set a bad precedent. So he only knows one remedy for the situation. And tonight, this could have been it. A gun. Please, put that away. He's a killer, Connie. But the guy's a hitman, a hired gun. He's come here to kill me. No, he hasn't. Have you, Mr. Derry? Me? Now, do I look like that sort of person, Mrs. Breach? Well, you don't look stupid, Mr. Derry. If you were going to kill my husband, you'd have done it by now. Why haven't you? I'll tell you why. Because he wants a deal. He wants me to pay him more than Harney's paying. Oh, be quiet, Eddie. Your husband isn't thinking straight, Mrs. Breach. It isn't that easy. You think that Harney will be satisfied if I let him live? If I walk off this job, somebody else walks in. This isn't the only gun in the world. He's right, Eddie. Maybe the only way is to give him the money back. There's nothing to give back. You think money stands still in this business? Look, maybe if we left town, went to Mexico or someplace... Arnie won't give up that easy. It means too much to him. Well, I'm not staying here. I'm getting out. I'm getting as far away as I can. Eddie. 
both of us, Connie. I meant both of us. <laughs> you expect me to run in a wheelchair? Maybe Mr. Derry can tell us what to do. I can think of only one thing. Joe Harney wants a dead body. That's what we'll have to give him. Well, we seem to have encountered a hitman with a heart. At least a hitman with a soft spot for a beautiful, afflicted young woman. But Jim Derry can't fail his assignment, either. If he doesn't collect the rest of the money, he may be collected himself. We'll find out what happens to this strange threesome when I return shortly with Act Two. The hired killer of Eddie Breach sits in Mr. Breach's comfortable living room. But the gun, which was supposed to have done the deed, rests on the coffee table. And Jim Derry paces the carpet and talks to the loving couple about death. It won't be easy, understand? But it's the only idea I got. The only thing that'll satisfy Joe Harney permanently. What do you mean about a dead body? I don't mean yours. I mean somebody else's. A body that could have been yours if the job had been done. A substitute. But how is that possible? There's a way. I have to stick my neck out to do it, and there'll be some expenses. How much? I have to let you know. Meanwhile, get ready to move and move fast. Have your bags packed and keep them ready. Get yourself some standby reservations. Mexico, Rio, any place you want. Don't make them in your own name. Oh, and one other thing. Don't leave the apartment for any reason. But I gotta leave the apartment. I got business to do. Business? Isn't your life more important? You can't risk it. Harney hired me to take care of you, but that doesn't mean one of his goons wouldn't try to beat me to it. There's a kid named Earl. Yeah, I know Earl. He's a punk. Just the kind of punk who might try shooting you in the back. Oh, do as he says, Eddie. Please. I tell you, I gotta get out. I need cash if we're to beat it out of town. I have to make collections. Mr. Derry, wouldn't you help him? Maybe if, if he had a gun so he could protect himself, then... You could lend me yours, Derry. Just until we leave town. All right. Take it. I'll see what I can do. Okay. I'm leaving now. Just keep calm until you hear from me. I'll see you to the door. Mr. Derry, why are you doing this for Eddie? Because he's such a regular fella. Figaro Mortuary. Fig, this is Jim Derry. Three cheers. What are you doing back in town? You ain't been here in ten years. Business, Fig. I'm here on business. Just like in the old days. The old days are over. I make more money legitimate now than I used to make crooked. For me, crime doesn't pay, like it says on the posters. <laughs> well, this is legitimate, almost. I want to make a purchase. What kind? You are the only store in town that has what I want, Fig. I want to buy a corpse. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing this for. I must be getting soft in the head. Tell me about the body, Fig. He's a short, heavy cookie, maybe 50 years old, full of mustaches. But does that matter? No. I guess it won't matter. Not after I get through with him. When can I take delivery? Uh, tonight. You can bring your car around to the back of my place, say, uh, around 11 o'clock. Okay, Fig. I'll be there. You sure there won't be any complications? No, the guy doesn't have any family. He'll end up in the city cemetery anyway. That's fine, Fig. That's just great. Come on, Derry. Come on, level with me. What are you going to do with a corpse? Who is it? 
It's Jim Gary. Eddie isn't here. He went out on business. Would you rather I came back later? Oh, no, of course not. Eddie should be home any moment. Come on in. He's been out raising money. It's wonderful how many people owe Eddie money. He's like a banker, really. <laughs> you know what he tells his mother? <laughs> what? He tells her he's an accountant. <laughs> She's a sweet old lady. She knows the truth, but she never lets on. And do you know the truth about him? I never had any illusions about Eddie. Would you like a drink? Oh, sorry, forgot. You don't drink. I'll take a beer if you have one. Coming right up. Oh, maybe when we were first married, I had an illusion or two. It's easy when you're young and you've got a nice straight spine. You're still young? Yes. Well, still that, I suppose. Oh, what do you know? No beer. It doesn't matter. Does he leave you alone a lot? I beg your pardon? That banker husband of yours. <laughs> Eddie's a busy man. He doesn't have normal hours like other people. I don't suppose that you do either. We're talking about Eddie. You're curious about him, aren't you? Trying to make some moral judgment? To decide whether he's worth saving or not? I've already decided that, haven't I? Do you know about Eddie and me? About the accident, yes. We were living in an old brownstone. Eddie was late. I was waiting for him at the top of the stairs with an argument already, and I... I said a lot of nasty things, and so did he, and he started to shake me, and I... I lost my balance. Well, how do they look? Your legs? They look fine. You'd never know they were dead, would you? You know something? I've got my own theory about you, Mr. Derry, about why you're helping us. You do? Mm-hmm. I've been a cripple for over a year, and I've become an expert on pity. I can spot pity half a mile away. You think that's my reason? That's everybody's reason. It's me, honey. Sorry. Hello, Derry. I just came to tell you that everything is set. What does everything mean? You are going to be a dead man by tomorrow morning. You can leave town as soon as you get on a plane. There's one leaving for Mexico City at four tomorrow afternoon. We got reservations. You better confirm them. What's going to cost me what you're doing? In cash, one thousand. Five hundred for me. Five hundred for a friend of mine. A couple of pieces of jewelry, and that car of yours. My car? You can't take my car. You won't need it in Mexico. They got donkeys. Now wait a minute, Eddie. We've got to do as he says. If you don't like my proposition, you can always say no. Then you can take your chances with Harney. Okay. What else do you want? I'll need your wallet, your watch, any other jewelry you carry. That wedding ring, is it inscribed? Yes, I had it done. Let's have it. What's the idea of all this? Your car is going to be in an accident tonight, Eddie. It's going to catch on fire. There'll be a body in the car, burned beyond recognition. But everybody will know who it is, of course. It'll have your wallet, your watch, your keys, your wedding ring. But whose body? Don't worry. The guy will be dead to begin with. It's only what you might call a cremation ceremony. So Honey will think you did the job? You'll only believe it if you get out of town as fast as you can. When that body is discovered, you are dead. I don't want you around making a liar out of me. <laughs> That's neat, Derry. Very neat. You still get paid that way, don't you? Eddie. Get me what I need, Eddie. The money and all the rest of the stuff. What about your gun? You want that back? Keep it as a souvenir. I never hold on to a piece after a job. And this job is just about over. <laughs> Hey, Derry. What do you want, Earl? Just want to give you a message. Mr. Harney isn't happy. Mr. Harney says he sort of expected some action by now. Tell him to read the contract again. I picked my own time and place. It says so in the small print. I thought you were supposed to be a pro. 
I would have had Eddie Breach stretched out and buried two days ago. I'm sure of it. And Harney's paying you three grand? I would have done it for half the money. You would have done it for laughs, Earl. You know something? I ought to show him that he didn't need you. I ought to take care of Eddie myself. Harney wouldn't like that. He's liable to spank. So long, Earl. All right, Earl. Hold it. Right there. Hey. Hey, what do you guys want? I'm Lieutenant Gear, police department. What I want's very simple, Earl. I want you. Well, here's the merchandise. Fresh from the freezer. Thanks, Fig. I knew I could count on you. You want to take a look at him? No. He ain't too pretty. I didn't get a chance to do any cosmetic work on him. It won't make the slightest difference. Okay. Let's get him in the car. Where are you, where are you taking him, Barry? To the country. Oh, boy. First time I ever heard of taking a stiff for a ride. for the ceremony. First, you've got to get behind the wheel. I'll dump your wallet in the clear. Now, oh, here's your pretty jewelry. That ring is a, a tight fit. Now, your keys, and that's about it. Except for that can of gasoline. There. That ought to be enough to make it hit the gas tank. Now all I need is a match. So Jim Derry has completed his assignment. He feels rather good about the job he did, too. It was a nice combination of human sympathy and profit. Five hundred from Eddie Breach, three thousand from Joe Harney, and a sense of having done something worthwhile for a change. But will Jim Derry remain pleased with himself? What will the arrest of Earl do to his plans? We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three. Only one thing remains for Jim Derry to do. He has to make one final call on the man who brought him to town in the first place. He has a good report for Joe Harney. And Joe Harney has $2,000 waiting for him. Yeah? Come in. Oh. So it's you. How are you, Mr. Harney? How do you think I am? Anything wrong? The cops picked up Earl on some old assault charge. That kid's more trouble than he's worth. I could have told you that. Well... At least there's one problem he won't have anymore. You mean breach? You won't be hearing from him again. Give me details. He's dead. That's a big detail. I want to know how. I got breach to take me for a little ride in the country. When we stopped to look at the scenery, I slugged him. Then I gave his car a little gasoline bath. You burned him? You want to see what's left? Take a drive out on Route 7... Make a ride on Potter Valley Road. There's not much to see, though. What'd you do after that? I took a nice long walk. There's a motel about a mile and a half south. I spent the night there. Didn't even get a chance to shave. Huh. Sure it went all right? 
Nobody spotted you? Our work is guaranteed, Mr. Harney. Money back if not satisfied. And speaking of money... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Two thousand bucks. And worth every penny of it. Excuse me. Your name James Derry? Pardon? I said your name James Derry. Yes, it is. Why? My name's Gear, Mr. Derry. Lieutenant Gear, police department. We got a warrant for your arrest. Me? You gotta be kidding. Step over here, Derry. Hey, hey, wait, wait a minute. Now. now you know the routine, I'm sure. Hands flat against the wall. Whatever you say. Well, not armed, I see. Why would an innocent citizen be walking around with a gun? <laughs> At this wallet of yours is sure loaded. What was it? Payday? That's my traveling money. You must be a high-priced man there. I sold a car for a guy. Second-hand sports job. That's the money he paid me for it. Yeah, sure. And I'll bet you got a copy of the bill of sale, don't you? Well, you give me a chance to get it, I'll... We'll talk about it at headquarters. You ever use an alias, Derry? No. What for? You know a man named Joe Harney? I met him once or twice. What do you talk about? The weather. Now, don't be cute, Derry. We talked about horses. Mr. Harney likes horses a whole lot. Yeah, we know all about that. We also know that Joe Harney paid your way into town a little over a week ago. Isn't that right? I can afford my own car fare, Lieutenant. Harney brought you here to do a special piece of work for him, didn't he? Wrong. You see, Derry, there isn't very much we don't know about Joe Harney. For your information, the DA has been lining up a case against him for the last six months. Your hard luck that you came into the picture right now. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, maybe I can make it a little clear. You got something I want to read to you. It's a statement from somebody you may know. Now, here it is. Listen carefully. This guy, Derry, arrived last Friday. He was brought in by Harney to cool a guy named Eddie Breach. Breach once worked for Harney, but then he got to taking bets on his own book. And that made Harney sore, so he decided to kill him. Derry's price for the job was three grand. Derry was staying at a hotel called the Gracie. He didn't tell Harney how he planned to kill Breach. Well, how does that sound to you, Derry? Like a fairy tale. Is it true or not? It's junk. They shouldn't make up junk like that. It's a statement we got last night by somebody who worked for Harney for the last two years. You know who I'm talking about? No. Name's Earl Clifford. You picked him up in an old charge, one that could have sent him to the joint for a good ten years. He's willing to turn state's evidence in the hope of getting a lighter rap. He probably will. I never heard of Earl Clifford. You can help yourself the same way, Derry. You can help by telling the truth. I am telling the truth. We want to know why you killed Eddie Breach. <sighs> Lieutenant, have you got the time? What? What time is it? 4.30. 4.30, that's what I make it to. And how is the weather out? Still warm and sunny. Good flying weather, huh? All right, what's the joke, Derry? The joke is over. I'm ready to tell you what I know, just as soon as I get a cup of coffee. Sure. I was hired to kill Eddie Breach. This guy, Joe Harney, called me and gave me the contract. I don't know why he picked me. I never did that kind of work before. Sure, Derry. We know. Your hands are nice and clean. Anyway, I came to see Harney. He told me the setup. Seen this guy, Breach, has been jabbing him for money. And he wanted him dead. Well, I said I'd do it. I see. Only I didn't mean it, Lieutenant. I'm no killer. Like you said, I'm clean. No record, nothing. No convictions, no. 
You know what I did? I went straight to Breach. I told him the whole story. Him and his wife. She's a cripple, you see, in a wheelchair. I felt sorry for her. For both of them. We know about Mrs. Breach's condition. Go on. I said I wouldn't do them any harm, but that didn't mean that they were safe. Harney would just hire somebody else to do the work. That was very nice of you. I wanted to help them, Lieutenant. I told them the only thing was to make it look as if Breach was killed. I said I could arrange the whole thing for them. And that's what you did? Yes. I got a body. A dead body from a funeral parlor, I know. I put the body in Breach's car. I drove it out on Route 6. Parked it on a side road called Potter Valley. I doused the car with gasoline. I set it on fire. You'll find Breach's watch and ring on that body. The wallet is in the grass someplace. Only the body isn't Eddie Breach's. Well, well. That's quite a story, all right. It's the truth. You send your boys out on Potter Valley Road. We don't have to do that, Derry. We've already found Breach's car. Well, swell, then you know I'm telling the truth. I mean, you got experts. They won't be fooled by a fake corpse. The guy was almost twice Breach's age. He was heavier, shorter. Tell me honestly, Derry. You did all this because you felt sorry for the guy? Yes. Look... I'm not saying he was an angel. He beat up his wife once. He made a cripple out of her. Only now, he's trying to help her. That's why he cheated Harney in the first place, to help his wife. A real sweet guy, huh? Well, Daddy, too bad it isn't true. What do you mean? Oh, Eddie was responsible for his wife's injury. We know that. Sure, he knocked her down a flight of stairs. But you know why? They had an argument about... Coming home late. Oh, no. They had an argument about a woman. She caught him in the apartment with a girl named Louise something. She didn't tell me that. And Breach didn't give up Louise after that, either. He's been cheating on his wife ever since. The fact that she was in a wheelchair only made it easier. No. I never knew about that. But his wife knew, Derry. What? That was the tough part. Connie Breach knew all about it. And there was nothing she could do. Just had to sit there in that wheelchair and let him do whatever he pleased. That's your good friend, sweet Eddie Breach. Well, she said she didn't have any illusions about him. She knew what he was. Too bad you didn't. All this time, she must have been hating him. Hating his guts. Anyway, they're gone now. They're on their way to Mexico City right now. No, they're not. Oh, yes, they are. They took a four o'clock plane. You're a liar, Derry. What are you talking about? You tell a nice, touching story. But, Derry, you're a liar. You made a deal with Breach, all right, sure. You, he gave you $1,000, and you arranged this phony car accident for him. But you intended to collect from both sides, didn't you? No, I was helping him get away. Well, let me read you something else. Edward Breach, 29 years of age, male Caucasian, shot to death in his apartment at 404 East 75th Street. What? The bullets came from a Farrington 38, found at the scene. That can't be. We traced the gun to the man who sold it to you, Derry. He can describe you to a T. Hey, wait a minute. That's how you got that three grand from Joe Harney, by doing the job you were hired to do. That's a lie. Breach took that plane, I tell you. He is on the plane. He's in the morgue, Derry, where you put him. It can't be true. All right, Derry. I see you need a lot of convincing. <laughs> Sam, send in Mrs. Breach. Connie is here? Right outside. Come in, Mrs. Breach. Are you sure it's... All... It's all right. Please come in. Well, they... They didn't tell me that... Mr. Derry would be here. I'm really sorry to do this, Mrs. Breach, but... It's really quite necessary. I want you to repeat exactly what you told me. Yes. All right. I... I was in my bedroom last night around 7.30... I heard the doorbell ring. 
And my husband answered it. Eddie was always having visitors at all hours, so I, I didn't think anything of it. And, and then I heard two shots. I, I was frightened, but, but I opened the bedroom door and looked out. And that's when I saw him. Saw who? He was standing there, holding the gun. I screamed and he dropped the gun on the floor and ran out. That's all right, Mrs. Breach. So I want it. Please. Can I go now? Yes, ma'am. You can go. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Now, Mrs. Mrs. Breach, Connie. How dare you call me Connie? You murderer. That was your mistake, Derry. You should have killed her, too. You were just too soft-hearted. Or maybe just forgetful, Lieutenant. About what? What they say about the female of the species... So the kind hearted hitman falls victim to a revengeful woman. We can only hope that justice finally triumphed. That Lieutenant Gear eventually realized the truth about what happened in that apartment on East 75th Street. Although, who's to say that Mrs. Edward Breach isn't already in a prison of her own contrivance? I'll be back shortly. enjoyed this tale of the Radio Mystery Theater? If you come back next time, I'm sure we'll have another tale of murder, trickery, deceit, terror, and other goodies. Our cast included Mike Kellen, Alan Manson, Earl Hammond, and Lon Clark. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams.